Rhodesian election, Robert Mugabe looks like walking it. Lord Soames appeals on television for calm after the result. The fishermen who are lucky to be alive. Common market set to bail out British steel. And Britain's Olympic athletes want to go to Moscow. Good evening. Mr. Robert Mugabe, the Marxist ZANU PF leader, looks as if he's walked away with the Rhodesian election. Predictions in Salisbury tonight are that he will get an overall majority, that's 51 seats or more, in the 100-seat assembly. Lord Soames now knows who has won, but no announcement will be made until tomorrow morning. The votes which were counted today were for the 80 black seats in the assembly. The other 20 seats reserved for whites have already been decided. One of Mr Mugabe's top officials, Mr Edison Svobgo, said he thought they'd won around 60 seats. Tonight, Lord Soames, Mr Mugabe and General Peter Walls, Rhodesia's supreme military commander, appealed for calm as tension rises in the country over the final result. Alistair Burnett is in Salisbury with an ITN team covering the election. Over now to Salisbury. The Governor, Lord Soames, faces the certainty tonight that the man he has to do business with tomorrow is Mr Robert Mugabe, the most left-wing of the black leaders. The universal belief here in Salisbury now is that Mr Mugabe has won an overall majority and the moderate Bishop Musarewa is nowhere. The most likely result in the morning is Mr Mugabe 55 seats, Mr Joshua and Como 20 seats and the Bishop only five. Mr Mugabe is the black leader who is most distrusted by Rhodesia's whites. However much Lord Soames may wish to form a coalition among all the black parties, including Mr Nkomo, who seems to have run pretty well as expected in his own Matabele land, and possibly the bishop, it's his talk with Mr Mugabe that will matter. All Mr Mugabe's opponents have in common tonight is to complain. Mr Mugabe himself appealed for calm on Rhodesian television tonight. The television here is still in black and white. Here's what he said. If your party emerges victorious, I appeal to you not to be too excited with joy. Remain calm and control yourselves. Do not be provocative, nor must you boo or insult or jeer at your losing opponents. Respect them and respect everybody. Do not create rowdy scenes and provide an excuse to those who would want to create trouble to do so. Do nothing that will disturb peace and calm. Those who have lost, I appeal to you to remain equally calm and refrain from pro provoking those who have won. Let us refrain from committing a single crime of violence in the course of our jubilation or as a result of our disappointment. We do not want to see any quarrels or fights or the throwing of stones or any acts of violence whatsoever. Law and order must be obeyed. We must uphold the rule of law. If you break the law, you will be arrested and punished for it. We must now, all of us, work for unity, whether we have won the elections or lost them. And this is so, whether we are black or white. The Rhodesian security commander, General Walls, the man most likely to appeal to disappointed Rhodesian whites, also asked for calm tonight his message in a moment. First, what Lord Soames had to say to all Rhodesians. What matters now is that Zimbabwe should make a new start in peace and dignity. This means that each and every one of us has a duty to set an example in remaining calm, whether you are jubilant or disappointed by the result. This is indeed a solemn hour for Zimbabwe there must be no violent action or reaction of any kind. After the results are known, it will be for the parties themselves largely to decide about the future government of Zimbabwe. My purpose is to bring about an orderly transfer of power to a stable government. Together with the party leaders, I will therefore be working for a broadly based government capable of achieving reconciliation and overcoming the divisions of the past. So much has already been done towards this that it would be tragic if we were to lose this opportunity now. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to appeal to you, and I do so now, as a person 
who may be just as disappointed or jubilant as anybody else about the results of the election, we appeal to you to remain calm. Ignore rumours. I've heard a rumour this afternoon that I've resigned. I don't know about it yet. So if you hear about it, don't take any notice. I've heard rumours this afternoon that ComOps has advised people to take this action or that. We've done nothing of the sort, ladies and gentlemen, of all races. Our advice to you is keep your nerve, keep a cool head, let's go forward together, let's all obey the law, then there can be no threat whatsoever to life and property. Anybody who threatens these, or anybody who steps out of line, I say again, will be dealt with effectively and swiftly, whoever they are and whatever their motives. We're with you. We're still the greatest power in the land, the lawful forces of the country. Please be with us. All day, all Rhodesia has waited for the result of the biggest political decision taken by most voters anyway in the 90 years since the first white settlers arrived. Michael Nicholson caught the mood. The various broadcast appeals for calm when the capital was ringed with Rhodesian military seemed only to add to an atmosphere of tension here. Field guns were stationed at all the main road junctions around the city and armoured cars patrolled the streets, especially those streets near the post office, radio and television stations. There was almost the feeling that calm will be imposed. The last of the votes were being counted this afternoon in the eight electoral districts. 93.6% of the voting population of nearly three million voted. And those who witnessed the various counts in Mashonaland couldn't help but conclude that Robert Mugabe's pile of ballot papers was noticeably higher than his opponent, Bishop Muzarewa. The declaration is at nine tomorrow morning, Rhodesian time, seven o'clock British time. Sir John Boynton, the British election commissioner who supervised the election, said tonight that the elections were, in his opinion, a genuine reflection of the wishes of the people. Notwithstanding the distortion of voting in those areas, I think my general conclusion must stand that in the Rhodesian context, the overall result of the elections will broadly reflect the wishes of the Rhodesian people. Over a thousand men of the British and Commonwealth Monitoring Force began their pullout at first light this morning from the assembly camps throughout the country. Tonight they're flying home in Royal Air Force VC-10s, completing what is almost certainly the most unique task in British military history, successfully separating three armies after seven years of bitter bush war. Five British in the monitoring force died in accidents over the past two months, but there were no guerrilla casualties. When their convoys reached the transit camp in Salisbury this afternoon, there was that lovely going home feeling. They didn't actually sing it, but it was there all right. Take me back to dear old Blighty. At Foxtrot, the assembly point where many of Mr Mugabe's guerrillas had been quartered, the British troops supervising the ceasefire have been pulling out today. So much so that tonight there are only six British soldiers left with 6,000 guerrillas. And David Smith is there too. There was relief mixed with satisfaction as the British troops in Camp Foxtrot headed for home early this morning after eight long weeks in the Rhodesian bush. Relieved because they're coming out unscathed, apart from some sunburn and mosquito bites. Satisfied because by and large it's been a job well done. For more than two months in this, the largest guerrilla camp, they've effectively been encircled by 6,000 troops from Robert Mugabe's army. The one element which has made it work has been the relationship between the British and the guerrillas. Many said goodbye this morning as friends. There was no animosity or there was no bitter feeling towards us of what we could see as cells. Um, the reaction I got from the PF to, our, to ourselves was good. You know, it's a lot better than what I expected. I think the PF will be rather sad in a funny sort of way to see us go, really. Apart from the protective element, I think we've all become quite good friends in a funny sort of way. There were some last minute snags with the Land Rovers, but the guerrillas got them going. And the Navy doctor fitted in a last minute session at his clinic, which has been handling a staggering two and a half thousand patients a week. They pulled out in convoy, quietly jubilant at going home, but taking no chances on this, the final stage of their stay in the bush. By tomorrow, when the election result is known, they'll be back in Britain.
Half a dozen volunteers are staying on to maintain a British presence on the big day, signalers and engineers, and of course the Major. Any worries for him? I think that they feel that they, we have played the game with them, and I'm sure, having talked to the leaders, that whatever instructions they get, they're fairly happy with the monitors and would hate to see anything happen to us. The Rhodesian forces who've moved in here are visibly tense. They don't move much from their part of the camp after threats from the guerrillas in the past 48 hours. For an Englishman, the tour didn't end today. Drill Sergeant Barry Linus, off with 600 guerrillas to a camp in the north, where he'll train Mugabe's men and their one-time enemies, the Rhodesian forces, in a new united army that, whatever the result tomorrow, offers real hope for the future. That's the political upheaval in the Rhodesia that Mr. Ian Smith once said would not have black rule in a thousand years. Now back to the studio in London. And here in London, 400 of the 600 British bobbies sent to Rhodesia to ensure fair play at the polling booths arrive back home. The rest will be coming back later this week. They said they thought the elections had been very fair, although some of them suffered from mosquito bites and one was laid up for a week after being bitten by a spider. They said that the only real problem was getting lost in the bush. The constables came back bearing masks and other souvenirs of their visit, and one quietly admitted that a few helmets may have been used in part exchange. And one of the three trawlermen rescued from the North Sea says that he didn't know whether he'd be found alive or dead. His story in part two. Common Market is coming to the rescue of British steel, and it could help to end the steel strike. Most of Britain's Olympic athletes say that they'll go to Moscow and why a school paid to see Sir become a skinhead in a couple of minutes. Television is a visual medium, but without sound, its power would be greatly diminished. This new Philips television is remarkable. It has an amplifier and two loudspeakers, which would do justice to a sophisticated sound system. So now, a Philips television will give you even more. Philips, simply years ahead. This week, the Daily Express is serializing the fictional story of a wartime secret agent. Some people say it could be true. His codename was Christopher Robin, and he carried out many horrific assignments, like the destruction of a Dutch submarine, to prevent the Americans being warned of Pearl Harbor. Assignments difficult for a grown man. Christopher Robin was only 16 years old. The Paladin, Churchill's boy spy. Could it have happened? Judge for yourself. Tomorrow in the Daily Express. Tea for two, please. And do you have any Jacob's Club? Ba, 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 a club. Ba, 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 Jacob's Club. Ba, 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 ba. Jacob's Club, the biscuit bar, bar none. One TWA return ticket to New York and two boarding passes. Boarding passes? With TWA's Airport Express, you get them in advance, so there's less queuing at the airport. That's marvellous. I've been flying to the States for years, standing in queues. TWA's Airport Express cuts down queues at airports. Queue half as long. Well, that's all right now, then, isn't it? But I'm retiring next week. Oh. You're gonna like us, TWA. The three fishermen who were rescued from the North Sea after three days adrift in a tiny rubber life raft have arrived home in Grimsby. They had to abandon ship after an explosion in the engine room and 20 ships passed them by before they were eventually picked up by a Danish fishing boat. Ken Rees was in Grimsby for their homecoming. As the little Danish fishing boat made for Grimsby early this morning, her three unexpected passengers were the happiest men on the whole North Sea. Their boat, the Olympic, had been sunk in a mystery explosion and Captain Hansen and his crew had jumped for their lives into a tiny rubber raft, unable even to send out an SOS. No one knew they were missing. 
Two days went by, they were cold, wet and in despair. For three days they bobbed around in that inflatable raft in the North Sea and they began to think that their days were numbered. But now they're seeing land again for the first time. And to help them on the last lap home, the Humberside lifeboat came out to whisk them to Grimsby and a medical check which showed that a good meal and a long sleep were the only prescription required. Their rescuers sailed into harbour several hours later. On board was the five feet circular raft which had saved their lives in a freezing North Sea. Shortly after he stepped ashore, Peter Grillis told me how he'd felt after three days with no sight of rescue. Depressed. Did you think you weren't ever going to get picked up, perhaps? No, I didn't think we'd... Uh, I knew we'd get picked up in the end, but whether we'd be alive or not was another thing. What was your feeling when you realised you were going to be saved? Just everything cool. <laughs> Do you know what the laugh cry with joy or what? You're the happiest man in Grimsby today? I think so. <laughs> I'm darkly <laughs> full. But no word to describe his feelings from Peter's other shipmate, Herlof Jensen. Just the nicest cup of tea he'd ever tasted. Ken Reese, News at 10, Grimsby. The common market is ready to put millions of pounds into the ailing British Steel Corporation. The money to counter the social consequences of the rundown of the industry could see thousands of steel workers retiring on full pensions at 55, and it could mean that British Steel can release other cash to improve the pay offer and end the 10 week old strike. The common market moves came as 160,000 steel workers received their ballot forms from the corporation asking if they wanted to vote on the present 14.4% pay offer. The main steel union has urged its members to ignore the ballot. Our industrial editor, Giles Smith, reports. Hopes that the EEC could, indirectly, break the deadlock in the steel strike and ease the social problems caused by the rundown came after a meeting in Brussels today between the corporation's chief executive, Mr Bob Scully, and top common market officials. Tomorrow, the industry minister, Mr Adam Butler, goes to Brussels to see the same officials. And tonight, hopes are high that some of the massive contribution we make to the EEC will come back to us to help us out of the steel crisis. There are many schemes under which community money could come to the BSC. In particular, a new plan for early retirement at 50 or 55 for thousands of men made redundant. This would remove some of the union's opposition to the plan and more importantly would free some of the money set aside for redundancy which could then go on pay. The catch is that the British government would have to provide one pound for every pound from Brussels. But it was being pointed out tonight that the government is already committed to £450 million pounds worth and that might fit the bill. Final agreement on any deal is some time off, but with the crisis deepening, everyone concerned is aware that if the EEC can break the deadlock where nobody else can, it would get them all off the hook. And the Prime Minister has been speaking tonight about government support for industries in trouble. At present, Mrs Thatcher said, too much money is being spent by government to support industries which continue to make heavy losses. She said there were a series of illusions that were stopping people tackling the country's problems. Let me list a few of the illusions which have blinded us. The illusion that government can be a universal provider and yet society will still stay free and prosperous. The illusion that government can print money and yet the nation still have sound money. The illusion that every loss can be covered by a subsidy. The illusion that we can break the link between reward and effort and still get the effort. The illusion that basic economic laws can somehow be suspended because we are British. The majority of Britain's Olympic athletes have said they do not support the government's call for a boycott of the Moscow Games. A poll announced today shows that 78 out of more than 100 athletes say they still want to take part. Here's our sports correspondent, Ian Edwards. The poll was conducted only among those athletes who have a realistic chance of being selected for the British team. And Derek Johnson, secretary of the International Athletes Club and an Olympic silver medalist in 1956, said the result confirmed the athlete's right to compete in the Olympics regardless of political pressure. He had the backing of his club chairman, David Bedford, as they explained how the athletes could, nevertheless, express their disapproval of Soviet policies by refusing to take part in the Olympic ceremonies. 
And if they won medals, they could leave the rostrum immediately after the presentation and before national anthems were played. I asked him why he felt they should go this far. Well, our athletes are under a tremendous amount of emotional pressure, which is coming from the British government. And we think that uh, by asking them to make some kind of reasonable political gesture when they're in Moscow, which frankly I think is rather more effective than a boycott, because if they actually stay off the opening and closing ceremonies and jump off the rostrums after they've received the medals, then that will actually be seen by 200 million Russians and countless millions of other people. We think that would be a, um, a reasonable thing to ask them and, and an effective one. Six policemen from the City of London are being held tonight at Bishopsgate Police Station following a burglary on a tailor's shop in the city yesterday. The policemen are an inspector, two sergeants and three constables, one of whom had recently been awarded the British Empire Medal. They were arrested some time after an investigation they had been carrying out into a burglary at the Fenchurch Street branch of Austin Reed. The arrests were made on the initiative of another police officer who had also been on that investigation. There'll be more talks tomorrow morning between the Colombian government and the guerrillas holding 13 ambassadors and a number of other hostages in Bogota. The guerrillas want a $50 million ransom and the release of 311 political prisoners, a demand they say is not negotiable. They freed five hostages yesterday, but they are believed to be still holding about 36 people, including the ambassadors. Martin Lewis has been following developments from London. A masked woman guerrilla strode out with one of the hostages, the Mexican ambassador, for the negotiations with the two almost over-casual officials from the Colombian Foreign Ministry. The rendezvous was in the back of a transit van, its doors removed, parked in front of the embassy the guerrillas had threatened to blow up if their demands were not met. Armed police kept careful watch as for 95 minutes the two groups argued. There was no public sign of any concessions on the government side, certainly no $50 million ransom or the release of 311 prisoners, which were two of the guerrillas' demands. But five more hostages, carrying a few belongings in Red Cross boxes, were released. A doctor, a retired naval officer, and three waiters. They revealed that 32 people were still held captive inside the embassy. In all, 23 hostages have been released so far, and the Colombian government has said that negotiations will continue. Lord Denning has condemned the practice of jury vetting by the police as unconstitutional. In the appeal court, Lord Denning said, so long as a person is eligible for jury service, I cannot think it is right that behind his back the police should go through his record. The United Nations commissioners in Iran have been given permission by the country's Revolutionary Council to visit the hostages in the American embassy. But the militant students holding the hostages say they'll only agree if they get a direct order from Ayatollah Khomeini. President Tito's doctors issued only a short bulletin today saying that his condition is still grave and that intensive treatment is continuing. The IRA claim they shot a British Army corporal in West Germany at the weekend. Corporal Stuart Leach from near Taunton in Somerset is in hospital in a critical condition. In Amsterdam, 35 people were injured in riots after more than a thousand police used tanks and bulldozers to smash barricades put up by squatters. The squatters had blocked several streets leading to a house they're occupying in protest over the council's housing policy. An American court has awarded world record libel damages of 18 million pounds to the owner of Penthouse magazine, Mr. Bob Guccione. It was made against Hustler magazine. Mr. Guccione may find himself setting another record. He's being sued for 45 million pounds for an article in Penthouse about a Californian holiday resort. British Leyland introduced a new model today, the T45 truck. Not as glamorous as some of its other models, but to a company with severe financial problems, just as important. BL's share of the British lorry market has fallen almost as steeply as its share of the car market, and this truck is meant to do something about that. It is, incidentally, the first completely new model of any kind at BL since the Michael Edwards took over nearly two and a half years ago. One of the oldest arguments amongst anglers is back in the news tonight, do fish feel pain? The RSPCA set up an independent inquiry which asked one of Britain's leading pharmacologists to find out. His conclusions, which will be published soon in a report, won't please the anglers. He's decided that fish do feel pain when they're hooked. 
This report from Sam Hall. Anglers traditionally have argued that fishing is not a cruel sport. They say fish are cold-blooded creatures and therefore can't feel pain. But new evidence from a leading pharmacologist has shown that when a fish is hooked, its nervous system does indeed tell it that the hook hurts. No, it's conclusive proof that there'll be specialized nerves that carry the signal indicating that the hook has damaged tissue and that they must take avoiding action um, so that this injury is not repeated. Are you an angler yourself? Yes. I'm and trout do, fishing. do you think it's a, a cruel sport on the basis of your findings? No, I think it's much more important that people learn how to land a fish properly and to dispatch them quickly. Some people are worried that angling eventually could be considered cruel and attract the protest groups. Most anglers seem reluctant to accept the evidence. An experienced fisherman would know any fish. <coughs> we all like fish. We all like them. We like to come back and get them another day. It's only a tiny little bit of metal, isn't it? There's only a little hole. No way to hurt fish. No, I mean, look at, the, look at the trawlers. All those fish cut around and suffer death on the decks in the same way as they are when they're hooked. A few anglers admit that hooks hurt. They say you can tell when you pick the fish up. But it's quite clear that, proof or not, the number of anglers is hardly likely to decline. Sam Hall, News at 10, on the banks of the River Thames. And tonight's soccer results in Division 1, Brighton 1, Aston Villa 1, and in the Scottish First Division, Motherwell 2, Hamilton 1. And just a reminder of tonight's main story, Mr Robert Mugabe seems to have won a clear majority in the Rhodesian election. Our team in Salisbury say that he may gain as many as 55 seats in the new 100-seat parliament. The official result will be announced tomorrow morning. A Welsh headmaster gave his 270 pupils time off from school today to watch him have his head shaved. Alan Rustad of HTV was in the audience. Mr Bill Hopkins' 270 pupils at the Mysia Handir Primary School paid 10 pence each to witness the shearing of their headmaster and they were determined to get their money's worth. They weren't disappointed. Apart from getting into the mood for his leading role in the school production of The King and I, he was also raising money for leukaemia research and school funds. And to wish him well, a message from the star of the West End production. How long before he's back to his hairy self? Well, Mr. Kurt, my hairdresser, tells me about four and a half months, isn't it, Robert? Yeah. About four and a half months, and I should be back in full plumage again. But the new look headmaster later received a mixed press. It's funny. Yeah? Would you like it like that? No. Why not? I don't know. You think it was worth the time? My head would get caught. I wouldn't have my dump for a thousand pounds. Wouldn't you? No. <laughs> Finally, tomorrow, in a special edition of News at 10, we'll be bringing you live from London and Salisbury an up-to-the-minute report on the Rhodesian election. That's all for now. Good night. Now the weather forecast. Overnight, a widespread frost throughout the Thames region. A general low of minus 2 centigrade, that's 28 Fahrenheit, but remaining dry. Tomorrow, temperatures recovering to normal, 8 centigrade or 46 Fahrenheit. Another spring-like day in prospect, with a slightly milder southerly wind and again sunny and dry. That's the weather forecast. Next on Thames, the Monday film. Kenneth Haig is Joe Lampton, Man at the Top. With fuel costs rising, gas still gives you good value for your money. Now, Maine and Parkinson Cowan have designed a range of beautiful cookers to make the most of your gas, like the Maine Sapphire and Parkinson Cowan 1950. Oven heat zones, so you can cook a complete meal at one setting. Spark ignition instead of wasteful pilot lights. And precise simmer controls for heat that obeys you instantly. Maine, Parkinson Cowan and gas. For people who haven't got money to burn.
If you're thinking ahead and have a lump sum to invest, come to Nationwide Building Society and ask about Nationwide Capital Bonds. They offer you Nationwide's highest rates of interest, plus this choice. You can leave your interest invested for fast capital growth, or you can have your interest paid to you every month to enjoy however you choose. No matter why you save, it pays to decide Nationwide. There's a branch near you. Come in and see us soon. Satisfying St. Bruno. Flake already rubbed. A real pipe smoker's dream. He's out right in. He's out? Do you know where he is? Just a minute, I'll look at his caps. His work caps here. His football caps here. His John Smith's caps here. His fishing caps missing. He's fishing. When it comes to John Smith's Yorkshire Bitter, never judge a person by appearances. Just popping down the road, love. More people get indigestion when they get to bed than at almost any other time. And that's when more people find relief with Rennie than with any other indigestion tablet. Rennie. George, your wife's cheating on you. What? She's cheating on the cheese. Dum, 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 cheat, dum, cheat on the cheese. Dum. Herbert, call that a cheese omelette? Don't you dare cheat on the cheese. Don't cheat on the cheese. Oh, well, I'm so worried. How can I satisfy his appetite? Don't cheat on the cheese. Dum, dum, cheat, dum, cheat on the cheese. Dum, dum, dum. Dum, cheat on the cheese. On the cheese. Tuesday night on Thames, and a great lineup of entertainment begins with Charlie's Angels at 7, while at 8 it's Armchair Thriller. Journalist Paul Marriott is attacked by a mysterious noise. A uh, noise? Yes, it got into my flat. It was after something that I'd got, a diary belonging to a dead girl. At 8.30, leave it to Charlie to sort out a broken romance. She hates me. She poured a pint of bitter over me head. Well, <laughs> women are like that, you know. Never do anything by halves. Nine o'clock finds Hollywood out west. James Mason tells the story of the famous Covered Wagon, a film made by people with a personal stake in the past, descendants of the pioneers who were themselves pioneers. While after the news, Jim Davidson is your host for the Brinsworth Tribute Show, a star-studded cabaret from Blazers Night Spot, Windsor. Programs for Tuesday night here on Thames. Now, the Monday film. This week, Kenneth Haig and Annette Newman star in Man at the Top. Thank you. 
Mr. Digby made me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> what do you have to drink, Joe? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, dry white wine, please. Dry white wine. 